This presentation is on the American Civil War and the first battle of the Civil War after the Southern states have seceded from the Union. And remember that the first state of South Carolina had left starting in December after Lincoln was elected in November of 1860. And over the next several months leading into 1861, there will be 11 total states that will secede and become the Confederate States of America. Well, the first Battle of Bull Run will happen in July of 1861, and individuals didn't really understand what would happen in this battle. And as you can see in this picture, there's actually going to be people that will come out, they will pack their picnic basket for a day, and they will out to watch a battle happen. And it quickly becomes clear that this war is not going to last just a short time as both sides thought it would be, but it's going to be a pretty bloody and intense war and many of these individuals get in the way of the retreating north as they're leaving. The Europeans will become involved um, in a few different manners and the Trent Affair was when was a crisis that erupted between the United States and Great Britain in between November and December of 1861 and the captain of the USS San Jacinto ordered the arrest of two Confederate envoys sailing to Europe aboard a British mail ship, the Trent, in order to seek support for the South in the Civil War. The British, who had not taken sides in the war, were outraged and claimed that the seizure of a neutral ship by the U.S. Navy was a violation of international law. In the end, President Abraham Lincoln's administration released the envoys and averted an armed conflict with Britain. The North is, will initiate the draft because of the fact that they don't have enough soldiers to fight. And part of the problem was that with the draft was that you could buy your way out of it. You, if you were wealthy enough and you pay, were willing to pay a couple hundred dollars, you could pay someone else to take your place. And so it really became a poor man's draft. The South will eventually initiate the draft as well. Conscription laws were initially, the military was initially composed of volunteers. And the first ever conscription law, which it means the draft, was found in 1863 because again of recruiting difficulties. And it was that all men between the ages of 20 and 45 were liable to be called in. Again, you could pay a fee of $300 or find a substitute. There are about 200,000 deserters that leave the military at this time. We will discuss in class the New York draft riot. This act was seen as unfair to the poor and riots in working class sections of New York City will happen with about 500 dying. A similar conscription act is passed in the South. Again similar reaction ages 17 to 50 and this will be passed in 1862. Um, 180,000 blacks will serve in the Union armies which is about 10 percent of Union enlist enlistments. About 38,000 died during the war and most of them came from slave states not most that died but most that served. Black volunteers were initially rejected until 1862 and the Confederacy was not willing to draft African Americans until one month before the end of the war, and this was too late. They were, however, used in war activities. There were also 29,000 Native Americans who served the Confederacy during this time period. And here is an image of a advertisement for joining the colored regiment of the Northern Union Army. And the most famous of the black regiments was the 54th Massachusetts. And if you are familiar at all with the movie Glory, that is what this story is about. It's a true story. And at dusk on July 18th of 1863, they spearheaded an attack of Fort Wagner in South Carolina. And the unit's colonel, Robert Gould Shaw, was a white man. And he was really instrumental in getting this group to be allowed to fight. Because in the beginning, while they drafted them, they often would just be used to go in and kind of round up the people that were left over after an attack, or they would steal livestock or different things like that. And Robert Gould Shaw you know, convinced the military that they deserved to be given the chance to fight and they fought very bravely um, in this battle. Here's an image of them storming Fort Wagner. And there's a memorial to Robert Gould Shaw that exists. There are several African-Americans that fight in many different Civil War battles. And you can see all of the little yellow things are battles in which black troops were used and the purple are all the Confederate states. Economics wise, the North is going to institute the first income tax in 1862. The income tax will not be official until 1916 for the United States as a whole. 
but they will use it to help fund the war effort. They will also increase the excise tax, which is the sales tax on tobacco and alcohol to help fund the war. They will pass the Morrell Tariff Act of 1861. They will raise it 10% to the level of the 1846 Walker Tariff. This protective tariff became associated with Republicans for the next 70 years, the concept of protective tariffs and the idea of imposing an extra tax on anything that was imported. They will also use treasury bonds, which is where people can invest in the government and they would eventually get this money back plus interest later on, but it helped to finance the war. They will establish the national banking system in 1863. They wanted to have a standard banknote currency. They will establish greenbacks, which is the first national currency. That's basically what we use today. They were green, that's why they're called that. There was $450 million issued to replace gold. And so it's not backed by gold anymore. The value is determined by our credit and it will continue to hold value even after the war. And so the North will come out economically far ahead of where the South is following the Civil War. And that will, a lot of these economic decisions will help to propel the next era, which is known as the Gilded Age. In the South, their money had been cut off as far as customs, money that was coming in on imported goods. So they're gonna sell bonds as well. And they will also do a tax increase, including a 10% on farm products. And it's going to account for only 1% of the whole funding for their southern government. So what they're going to do is print money. And the problem with printing paper money is that they're going to just create more and more of it, which makes what is already in circulation worth less. And this will cause runaway inflation um, as they print all of this extra money and prices will be super sky high and the money in their pockets will be worthless. So here's an example to show you. In 1860, a pound, 10 pounds of bacon was $1.25. Three years later, it's $10. Look at coffee, four pounds for 50 cents versus $20. So things are completely out of control on the prices. Wartime, there's definitely prosperity. As I mentioned, this is the beginning of the Gilded Age, and this will produce the first millionaire class in the United States, which we'll talk more about during the Gilded Age time period, which is period six. And it will give people the opportunity to, as captains of industry, basically use their resources to create huge businesses that will make them wealthy, provide job opportunities. They will be able to create machineries and oil will be huge as will steel business. And we'll talk more about that later. Some of the reasons that there is prosperity in the North and that the, the Gilded Age is able to happen, providing context for it includes these acts that were passed, the facilitated Western movement. The Homestead Act is going to give free land to pioneers that are willing to settle out West. They'll get 160 acres as long as they agree to stay and farm the land for five years. The Murrell Land Grant Act of 1862 is really important for any of you who plan to go to a Cal State University system because this is how they were founded. Um, they through this land grants, they're known as land grant colleges. And the profits from selling the lands is going to finance agricultural and mechanical colleges. If you're familiar with Texas AM, that's what AM stands for, is agricultural and mechanical as well as I mentioned, the state college systems. The Pacific Railway Act of 1862 will be authorized to build a transcontinental railroad that will connect the Northern states to California. And this will be completed, something that we'll talk about again in period six, when we get to the Gilded Age. It's possibly the most important technological event of the 19th century because it's going to link the East Coast from the West Coast and people will be able to travel completely across the country at that time. Civil liberties take a hit during this time and the expansion of government is huge. Lincoln will suspend certain civil liberties during this time in the name of war. Um, some of the things that he will do includes a union blockade without the approval of Congress. He uses an executive order. He will increase the army and navy again without congressional approval. He will extend volunteer enlistments again without congressional approval. He will advance $2 million to private citizens for military purposes without congressional approval. He will supervise voting in border states by the Union Army. He will suspend certain newspapers and he will outlaw slavery in all national territories. So he is going to use and kind of co-opt a lot of the power that should be for Congress in the name of war and the fact that he needs it. And lots of presidents seem to expand the role of their executive branch during times of war. Another example would be the Vietnam War when Lyndon Johnson greatly expands the power of the presidency. 
Additionally, Lincoln will suspend habeas corpus, which is the right to be released from unlawful imprisonment. He's just going to keep him in prison if they're opposed to the union and arrested, which technically goes against the Constitution. And a court case here, ex parte Merriman, in 1861, 864 people are held without trial during the first nine months of the war. And the ruling is that this habeas corpus can only be set aside by Congress, but Lincoln's going to ignore it. Uh, the significance is, again, during times of war, the president seems to bend the law for the welfare of the country, and it will happen again. During some important battles, we're not going to talk about very many, but the Battle of Antietam, which happens on September 17th of 1862, is the bloodiest single day in American history. And these are some images. The ones on the left are taken by a man named Matthew Brady, who is really the first person to photograph war. And you can see here what it talks about the cornfield. And the picture on the right is one I took when I had the opportunity to visit Antietam a few years ago. And this is a quote that talks about that area. As we appeared at the edge of the corn, a long line of men in butternut and gray rose up from the ground. Simultaneously, the hostile battle lines opened a tremendous fire upon each other. Men, I cannot say fell, they were knocked out by the rank, of the ranks by dozens. But we jumped over the fence and pushed on, loading, firing, and shouting as we advanced. There was a reckless disregard of life, of everything but victory. And this was a quote given at talking about the battle in the cornfield. Here is another image of Bloody Lane. And this is a picture I took again from the top of a lookout tower. And this is a ditch basically in which the Confederates hid, hoping to surprise the Union soldiers as they came across the field, but it didn't work. Instead, the Confederates were trapped. And again, this is the first widely photographed war. So these images are taken by Matthew Brady. Newspaper drawings had been what it was before, and it really didn't give people an idea of what war was about, hence why they showed up at the first battle of Bull Run with their picnic baskets. We spent a tremendous amount of money. He took these photographs, he ended up bankrupt. However, thanks to him, we actually have photographs of the Civil War. So he really is more of a hero in his uh, death than he was in life. This is how a war battle would have been shown in Harper's Weekly or one of the newspapers of the time period, which really doesn't give you the idea of a bloody battle compared to having dead bodies laying around a fence. At the end of the day, 23,000 men had been killed, wounded, or captured in a single day, hence why it's called the bloodiest day in American history. In the end, there was no clear winner. General Lee withdrew, who was a Confederate. McClellan considers himself the victor. But this battle is really important for a couple of reasons. Number one, it convinces the British and the French who thought about recognizing the Confederacy as a legitimate country to not. And this will also give Lincoln the opportunity to announce his Emancipation Proclamation. So when you consider the importance of Antietam, consider those two things. Again, it delayed British and French recognition of the Confederacy and gave Lincoln the opportunity to announce his Emancipation Proclamation. So the road to emancipation included the confiscation acts that are passed and the second confiscation there's going to be a couple of different ones here that are going to happen and my paper okay the first confiscation act is on august 6th of 1861 it was not an explicit freedom statute, but it authorized Union Army officials to seize any slaves employed by the Confederate Army. The second, uh, they were not trying to define the legal status of fortified, forfeited slaves. They were not fully addressing the concerns of so-called contrabands. However, it had the effect of increasing the spread of freedom almost immediately. And they directed Army officers to receive and protect fugitives from both disloyal and loyal masters. However, a number of Union officers continued to return fugitive slaves or deny runaways protection. So eventually Congress will pass a second Confiscation Act in July 17th of 1862, declaring confiscation as punishment for treason and in labeling Confederate slaves as captives of war who were to be forever free. This included any slaves employed by disloyal masters anywhere, not just those employed by rebel armies or navies. Lincoln will sign this new confiscation statute uh, Reluctantly, he was convinced that it was both unconstitutional and impractical, and so he proceeded to make plans to supersede congressional confiscation with his own emancipation policy. 
So Congress will propose the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery, but this does not seem to be the time for that. And so there will be a proclamation that's issued in September of 17, sorry, 1862, that he will ultimately then pass on, on January 1st of 1863, following the Battle of Antietam. Uh, back to Fort Monroe really quickly there, that was located in Virginia. It was the only federal military installation in the Upper South under US control, and it housed refugee slaves. General Butler learned about three escaped slaves who ran to the fort. He refused to turn them to return them to their slave owners and classified them as contraband. So this led to the confiscation acts that I mentioned that, again, any property used by Confederate military, including slaves, could be confiscated by Union forces, considered to be contraband. And so this is going to lead to the Emancipation Proclamation, which is something that students consistently misunderstand, misinterpret, probably adults misinterpret too. This frees all slaves in areas in rebellion against the United States, effective January 1st, 1863. So this does not free all the slaves, does not free any Northern slaves. It frees slaves in the Confederacy. But considering the Confederacy felt themselves to be a foreign nation, they didn't really care that Lincoln was trying to free the slaves. So this really serves as a morale booster um, for the North and is designed to create chaos in the South as hopefully slaves begin to hear about this, they think they're free and they start rebelling against their masters. And it's really important to understand that slavery was not a reason we were fighting this war, it was to preserve the Union up until this point. This is when slavery becomes now one of the main goals and focuses of the war is to end slavery. And this is an ironic cartoon that shows up just before emancipation, the great Negro emancipation. And it's postponed until 1900. And you'll notice that the irony of this is that most of these slaves could read or write, so they wouldn't be able to understand that anyway. The Battle of Gettysburg is again, another important battle. It spans over three days, another bloody, bloody battle. And you have here just show a map showing you Gettysburg and Antietam are the only two battles of the Civil War that are fought in the North, in the Union. And here is, again, a sketch artist of showing what the battle was like. Doesn't give you any idea what it really was like. And this is the bloodiest battle. 51,000 people were killed, wounded, or captured in just three days. And much of the casualties were due to small arms fire. And you can see how many troops there were, how many were killed, how many were wounded, how many were captured or missing from each side here. And these are th four pictures I took. When I went to Gettysburg, one of the things that impacted me most was just seeing these blocks that literally had 534 bodies from Pennsylvania. They had no idea the names of the people, what part of Pennsylvania they came from. They just buried them. And these are buried at Gettysburg Cemetery. And here again is another image that I took showing Gettysburg today. They have hundreds of these statues and markers and everything and spending multiple days in Gettysburg and you still can't meet, you still can't read and see every single statue that was there. It is incredible, the memorials that they have put up. Here are some more memorials. This is the Eternal Light Peace Memorial that was dedicated by Franklin Roosevelt at the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. Again, more images. You can see how flat it was. There's really no place to hide. So the type of warfare that they engaged in back then was so different than today. A monument to Tennessee. There were monuments to pretty much every regiment, every state, both Confederate, both, and um, Union. Here is a monument to Robert E. Lee. One to Alabama. This is the view from what was called known as Little Round Top. And you see the rocks kind of clustered in the middle there. That was one of the places where the Confederates were holed out. And you can see the advantage gained by the North from being up high. The Bloody Wheat Field was another area where a lot of individuals died over two and a half hours. On November 19th, President Lincoln will dedicate a portion of the Gettysburg Battlefield as a national cemetery. And he was not the primary speaker that day. In fact, as part of his speech, he says people will little remember 
what we did here, what I said here, but people really obviously remember what he says there. And it was just 13 sentences and 274 words. And even though he wasn't the keynote, the most important speaker, that's who was remembered. And it starts off with four score and seven years ago, our four, forefathers brought forth on this nation or on this continent, a great nation. And here's a memorial that I, again, another picture I took. Black troops were used to free the slaves in the South following this point. This was a total war. Civilian targets were used, particularly with Sherman's march. When he begins to march towards the sea, he has no problem burning the resources. He, he burns the fields down. He slaughters the livestock to try to prevent the South from having any resources and being able to continue to fight. This is also a total war because resources were allocated toward the war effort from individual citizens. Their crops were expected to use, be used to feed the soldiers. Modern technology is used, obviously not compared to today, but for then it was modern. Here is a picture of Sherman's march to the sea. In January of 1865, transportation problems and the successful blockades caused several shortages of food and supplies in the South. Starving soldiers began to desert. End of the war happens on April 9th of 1865 when Robert Lee, E. Lee surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse. And just a few days later, on April 16th, 1865, President Lincoln goes to see our American cousin and he is shot and killed by John Wilkes Booth. The major results of the Civil War include the establishment of the supremacy of the federal government, the idea that once you are a state, you can never leave, the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery, the 14th Amendment, which granted citizenship to all people born in the US, the 15th Amendment, which granted right to vote to all male citizens over the age of 21. We will discuss these in more detail in the Reconstruction Unit. There will be two reconstruction plans. Both Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson will want to restore the Southern states as quickly as possible, but a group called the Radical Republicans will want to punish the South. And that is it for the Civil War.